For over two decades, some people who are unsheltered have taken refuge in the flood channel tunnels underneath the city. And when you have great wealth flowing through the gambling palaces above and abject poverty below, it's going to make for some really sensationalist reporting. Today on CityCast Las Vegas, lead producer Sonia Cho Swanson and Nevada Current journalist Michael Lyle join me in trying to have a different kind of conversation about the estimated 500 folks living underground and how to make things better. Every year, we get reports of someone drowning in the tunnels, and the recent floods this month caused at least one additional death. Perhaps a different kind of conversation is long overdue. It's Monday, September 25th. I'm David Figler, and here's what Las Vegas is talking about. MJ Lyle, the Nevada Current and lead producer of CityCast Las Vegas, Sonia Cho Swanson. Welcome to CityCast Las Vegas. Hey, hey, thanks, David. Thanks for having me. Good to be back. I like this crew. We always have very thoughtful conversations. And today we're going to talk about something that a lot of people seem to talk about. Let's just start off, MJ. Why do you think the tunnels under Las Vegas have captured America's imagination? That is a question that I always think about, especially when we see local and importantly national and international stories at least once or twice a year that focus on the tunnels. And I don't have a definitive answer. I think part of it is I think we're attracted somewhat as a society to some of these stories that are A little bit of tragedy porn, if you will, of like some of the stories that show like the seedy sides of things, which is why we're like attracted to like murder podcasts and attracted to some of these like these stories that outsider groups. And is there anything more outsider than undergrounders? (laughs) Yeah. And I can't help but wonder, too. I think people have a a depiction of what homelessness is in this. This almost acts as a form of confirmation bias of like, this is what people already assume what homelessness Mm. is, is the true face of homelessness. And so reading that story kind of confirms what they already think they know about it. Yeah. I think it's like a fascination with almost like a post-apocalyptic survival story. You know, it's kind of like the question of like, that's central to Lord of the Flies, right? Where all those little boys are on the island and it's like, what would happen if the rules of society were gone? What would humanity be like? So it's like fundamentally, what is human nature without the rule of law, right? Yeah. Is it Mad Max under Las Vegas? Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, we already get all this attention just because we're Las Vegas, which is already weird to most people who don't live here, right? Yeah. All the people looking in are like, Las Vegas, and they all have their ideas, whatever it is, usually not positive. Hmm. And then, you know, this juxtaposition and above the glitz and glamour. Oh, always. Oh my God. Always the glitz and glamour. Oh, I hate it. I hate that trope. Don't Is forget that... the neon. <laughs> right? What happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. But if you're one of the unfortunate who live underneath the city, you know, that sort of crap. <laughs> oh, we've seen it all. But I am, I mean, to be fair, I am actually kind of curious because I feel like I have read these bylines, but I don't know that I've learned very much about tunnel life. How is tunnel life different you know, for unsheltered folks than other above ground options. From talking to folks that have lived underground and talking to folks that do outreach in that community, it seems like this is a population that has been unhoused for a prolonged period of time. These are Mm. people that are deemed chronically homeless, that they've tried the shelter life and it's not for them. They've tried accessing services and have been burned by services sometimes, Mm -hmm. have been reached out to resources before and just have not gotten what they needed. Uh, And so have not only just retreated to encampments, but retreated underground away from even main encampment life and and the deserts where you see tents and uh, uh, structures develop. They've kind of gone underground into a community that just kind of away from the things that have let them down. Hmm. What does it look like? I mean, I I don't know about y'all. I actually have not been inside any of the tunnels, even though in high school, it was definitely like a, a cool kid thing to do was to go explore the tunnels. Or a dare. Or a dare, right? But what would I see if I walked into a tunnel where where unsheltered folks are living? 
there are structures actually inside these tunnels. Like many of the unhoused folks have built actual little communities, whether it's actually drilling in structures into the the walls and Whoa. having four walls that you train, chain off so no one can get in to having AC units and fridges and king size mattresses. Hey, how are they getting electricity? You said AC units? Yeah. So I was talking to, I was doing some outreach for a recent story that I was working on and it was a uh, Help Southern Nevada was doing outreach outside of the uh, New Orleans tunnel. And I was talking to one of the workers and he was saying, saying that he once met or saw solar panels outside the tunnels and they people were connecting it inside to get some power. I, I haven't seen that, but that's what he told me like wow. that exists. And so um, I think we're, it is resourceful. I mean, these are people that have lived on the streets for so long that they are resourceful. They know how to survive. It's not beyond imagination to be able to, you know, redirect or hijack electricity or even have, you know, generators and you know be out um, <laughs> in a very Mad Max way and not to be pejorative anyway, but, you know, salvaging uh, gasoline where you could find it and bringing it down and, and keeping power going that way. I mean, I've seen lights and uh, other site-specific amenities that, yeah. you know, keep people not just off the grid, but out of sight off the grid, yeah. right? I mean, mm-hmm. that seems to be the giant allure of, of being in the, the tunnels as a, I don't know, an option when you're in that desperation status. Mm-hmm. You know, MJ, there have been people who have been extended residents down in the tunnel area, you know, over the past 20, 30 years, to my knowledge. Are, are there characteristics of some of the communities down there? I mean, can you generalize a little bit what life is like down there? I think it's just what life is like up here. People do make friendships with with just the other people in, in, those, in those tunnels, and they have a, a community. I also... I say this and I know that people are going to gasp, be like, oh, how dare they? But like, I see a lot of people that have their pets too, and they are such loving pet parents. And so that's why I'm hesitant because people will probably think, oh my gosh, you have a dog in the tunnel. Like, yeah, they take care of that. They're what's one of their, their children too. And so I think that's the same community exists there that exists anywhere else. I think that's just a common misconception that we of homelessness in general and those people that choose tunnel life is that they're somehow different or more nefarious or more darker or like reserved. Yeah, you do have some reserved people. That's with every type of homeless encampment that you see. But like there are people that are part of communities that are with a couple other people, sometimes a significant other, uh, which is probably a reason also why they don't go into shelter space because they'd be separated from their community or significant other. And so or their pets or their pets. Right. Exactly. Or other barriers. I mean, Mm -hmm. let's let's, you know, talk about this in the broader terms is that choosing to reside, you know, in this very extreme version of an encampment, which is, you know, in these tunnels could be from a lot of different things. You know, the, the barriers to get into the shelters, which is where people try to push folks, aren't always a fit. And we forget that. This is probably an obvious question, but what what are the specific dangers that people are facing in the, in the tunnels if they do stay down there? What are they looking at? I mean, I think the most common one, I think the most noted one is just the fact that we have monsoon season and sweeping rainwater will pour in and it puts people at risk of drowning. I think that's when we see the most common coverage mm-hmm. and kind of the retread of the same story of like what happens to people that live in these places once uh, the rain starts coming down and flows so fast. I think that's the most mm-hmm. immediate danger you you see down there. Um, yeah. I mean, they're flood channels. There's going to be standing yeah. water at times, too. That can't yeah. be the best to live in. Or healthy or anything. What else, MJ? What are what are some other hazards we should be aware of uh, for, for folks that are in, indeed living down in those flood drain tunnels? I actually want to take a step back and just talk about their perception, too. There's a lot of people that even though we have perceived hazards, obviously floodwaters and like safety issues, people live there perceive that as a safer alternative to shelters, to dorm congregate style shelter spaces. And so Mm. when we say what are the safety issues, we think safety issues in one term. They think safety issues in another term. And so 
for some of them that live in that in those spaces, like this is the safest option for them where they're not going to be harassed from other people experiencing homelessness, harassed from other uh, law enforcement that they might face when they're in encampments that are in broad daylight or outside are more mm-hmm. visible. Some people opt into congregate shed- settings, which is apparent by them at or near capacity almost every night. But for some people, that just does not work for the anxiety that they're facing, for the mental health factors that they're facing. They just w- want to be in a room with 45 to 100 other men. Um, and so when we talk about safety issues, what we perceived as a safety issue might not be what safety means to, to them. What life means for them. Yeah, I think, too, about the fact that like a lot of times folks who do have housing see someone who is very clearly unhoused and see them as a threat, when Mm. in fact, I think unhoused folks are actually themselves often the victims of crime and the victims of violence because they're so unprotected out in the streets. But I have to also say I've actually heard stories like it's probably like an urban legend, but hearing about like the tunnel serial killer who is attacking unhoused folks who live in the tunnels. I mean, it seems like there's less eyes on the tunnels and they might be more vulnerable in some ways down there. You know, you're right. There there has been for a long time an urban legend of a tunnel serial killer. I think it's kind of a conflation of a lot of individual events. Hmm. Uh, and then, like, I represented somebody who was purported, he, he was a really big guy, hmm. uh, and by all accounts, he feigned deafness. So he kind of just grunted and yelled at people. Wow. But everyone said that he would carry around a actual severed head to lord over individuals and he was accused formally of like being involved in mass sexual assault of Hmm. uh, women who are living in the tunnel uh, and and other nefarious things Uh, he was ultimately accused of a a murder that was unrelated to the tunnels long long story but his looming presence down in the tunnels for a long time was part of that mythology or myth building that hmm. made the urban legend. And that's that's how urban legends start. There's always some grain of truth right. or different parts of a story that come together. So, yeah, I, I mean, not, not without its intrigue, not without its factual basis in some level. But, you know, again, because it is so off of our grid, so out of our mental comprehension for those of us who are, you know, inside people, mm-hmm. <laughs> It's seemingly really, really bad. And Hmm. I I think that fuels some of the conversations about it, too. So obviously there are safety concerns and the story that you you highlight it is a real facts, a real story. That is something that happened of, of a person that was unhoused that was clearly unsafe. But like data wise, we don't really see that. But yeah. In our minds, that's our perception of what unhoused people are like. And I can't I can't help but think of the death of Jordan Neely in New York City. He was a man on a subway that was mm. not harming a single person, but was screaming and making noises. And someone uh, on the sidelines decided to put him in a headlock and choke the life out of him for 15 minutes mm. while everyone watched and thought that this was seemingly okay because we have this perception of what those unhoused are. And I can't help but think that perception of who people thought Jordan Neely was is probably how we characterize a lot of our unhoused folks that live in these tunnels too. So I am real weary about like how we talk about this population because yes, some of them, they do have mental health needs. I mean, Societally speaking, we all have mental health needs, and they're, it's exasperated. Here, by, here, <laughs> it's exasperated yeah. by just being unhoused. But like, yeah. Yeah. I feel that when we talk about like the dangers and like the our perception of what unhoused folks in these tunnels might be like, we risk of uh, creating a monster that's, that's just not there. But can I just ask, because this is something I like mm-hmm. genuinely wonder: How can we balance that view, MJ, and not try to? put homeless people into like one kind of nefarious, you know, scarecrow, you know, argument of one kind of biased viewpoint of who a homeless person is at the same time while acknowledging the struggles that people go through and to actually talk about the fact that life is really hard in encampments and that life really is hard in the tunnels and life is dangerous there. Like, how can we balance that? Better reporting, number one, I think, is one on how we approach it, because I think the, the, the approaches that have sort of spawned this conversation are not the right way. Right. Because it's like, but we want to acknowledge the fact that, like, there was a, a man who was preying on women in the tunnels. Well, I mean, those were the allegations. OK. But he was not convicted of that. But by the same token, that, you know, vulnerability is something I think we could all accept as being likely or possible. 
uh, whether it was my client or, or, you know, someone else or in the future. And that vulnerability that you speak of that exists in and that exists everywhere in society and in particular, but it exists among unhoused, whether they're in the tunnels, whether mm. in shelter spaces, whether in encampments, whether in transitional housing folks. I think that vulnerability doesn't go away or isn't like uh, it might change in the tunnel life. But I think that vulnerability, to David's point, there's not a lot of reporting about that vulnerability and like a lot of nuance around it that, yes, you have perpetrators of violence, but you also have victims that are also trying to survive. And part of that escape into the tunnel space is that survival mechanism because victimization has happened on the surface level. Let's just assume that you you aren't going to get everyone to leave the tunnels. They're going to stay down there. It, is there another approach that's more like harm reduction? And what would that look like? Because you still had that flooding thing. That's a fascinating question. I don't even know how to approach that response. On one hand, yeah, you're right. We It is a physical hazard to people to be there in a place that could literally end their lives because of just un- unforeseen monsoon seasons and rain sweeping them away. But to your question about harm reduction, I think we need to have better conversation about what it means for them to survive. Many of the people down there have been explicit about what they would like and what they need to actually uh, embrace shelter or embrace housing. Um, I don't know if we've taken a lot of their concerns into consideration, even though they keep saying it over and over again, even though uh, those are helping them keep saying this is what they need and this is why they're not entering shelter. And so maybe we do need to have a more robust conversation. Some cities have experimented with encampments in general, like having designated encampment space. I think Portland looked at doing a designated encampment space. So maybe we can't have, obviously, people staying in these public ways, but we have people that aren't ready to go into shelters or just want to be let alone. What would Mm -hmm. it look like? What would harm reduction look like if we as a county discuss designated camping spots for them just to set up and have their own life? We don't have these robust conversations. And it goes back to the retread of the same stories over and over again. Honestly, I love thinking about harm reduction. I love that you brought that up, David, because one of the things that people going to the tunnels shows me is that we have a real lack of shade, right? Isn't that one of the big draws of the tunnels is the cooler temperatures and like the actual shade that you get from the blazing sun? So if we did have, MJ, like you were suggesting, like a, you know, some kind of designated encampment like Portland has, I think a huge part of that has to be protection from the sun. It's just one of the most brutal parts of living outdoors in Las Vegas. Which is one of my major criticisms of the courtyard downtown is it does, doesn't have walls. Also prone to flooding. <laughs> also prone to, is it really? <laughs> yeah, every time, it, I feel like every time it rains or in the past, I've seen it rain. I don't know if it's in recent, but I remember many times that it's rain and like they've had a fix their operation because like things are get very damp because it's open air. People are still sleeping open air. You know what I was thinking with harm reduction, Mm -hmm. and I don't think this is as radical maybe as creating an encampment area, is sending medical crews down there. Hmm. I mean, I think there might be unique medical concerns about people who are spending too much time in a flood channel. Yeah. I, I mean, what we really do talk about is we just have to get them out of there. And we're also hearing that they're never going to leave there. And I guess that comes around to the ultimate question. How do we talk about the tunnels? Yeah. If I see one more article where they're called mole people, which just is is sickening to me to, to even use that term because uh, it's so dehumanizing. Uh, what do we do? How do we change the language, the narrative, the media coverage? When I see coverage, I'll oftentimes I see the quotes of like, don't come back. We don't want you here. I don't see anyone answer the question. Answer the question. Well, where are they supposed to go? We are exploding in our homelessness. We're in a full fledged homeless crisis. Our numbers are growing year after year. Um, we don't have adequate shelter space. We don't have this the type of shelter space that people actually want and need. We could clear out all the hunter shelters right now. We would still have a giant homeless problem because people are waiting months, if not years, on housing assessment lists, waiting for their number to come up so they can be properly housed. Like I said, I was at the New Orleans Tunnel outreach recently, and people were we're doing housing assessments, but one man I, I spoke with did his housing assessment, won't have anything for at least three months. If we're not building the type of uh, resources that actually they would want to utilize, 
we're hitting a dead end, a dead end by saying like you can't stay here. So more media coverage that actually focuses on what the root of the problem is rather than the symptoms of the problem. I mean, I'm always about talking about root and systemic, hey. systemic causes, though. Yeah, you know me. Uh, <laughs> That's why we love you today. <laughs> I think asking also to the folks, why tunnels versus above ground from your perspective? Why, why specifically did you do it? And I think that might give some insight on some policy changes or some policy directives. We do tend to lump in all encampments together, and yet we also are dealing with the tunnels being this sort of special above, um, you know, the fold type of reportage, this like, I don't know, this sensationalist uh, reporting. Yeah. Like, so basically, are you t- are you talking about the tunnels to sort of like sensationalize them, or are you talking about them to actually catapult a bigger issue about housing policy to like the broader audience, essentially. I think the notion of tunnel coverage, I am I think it is tired. I think we just keep retreading the same tunnel story. And so even going back to that whole beneath the glitz and glamour, I think the, there's a policy question at, at play behind that. I think what the reporter, whenever they use that tired Tired, mm-hmm. tired trope. I'm so tired. <laughs> tired, tired, tired trope. Um, I think what they're trying to get at to you is why in a place with such wealth do we have a place of such despair? But they don't really get there in their story by talking mm. about the tax policies and structures and revenue structures of the casinos mm. and what they pay in taxes. That's a better Oof. story than like what we actually are talking about, but we just don't get there. Yeah, I mean, see also education, mental health, affordable housing, medical care. Need I continue? Yes, I child mean, care. We do have a lot of wealth yeah. in this community, but we also have a lot of these pervasive issues. And the tunnels are part of that conversation. And so I'm glad that we had a thoughtful conversation about the tunnels, calling out maybe some that's not yeah. as much. And stop using the word mole people, folks. Stop using yes. the phrase mole people. Yeah, it's not good for anyone or anything. No. MJ Lyle, Sonia Cho Swanson, thanks for another like remarkably thoughtful conversation. Thanks, David. Thank you. That's all for today here on CityCast Las Vegas. If you enjoyed the show and want to continue the conversation, leave us your thoughts in a review. And also, make sure to subscribe to our morning newsletter. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Take care. I'm frozen?